My Platonic Sweetheart. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. My Platonic Sweetheart by Mark Twain. Note. Mark Twain was always interested in those psychic phenomena which we call dreams. His own sleep fancies were likely to be vivid, and it was his habit to recall them and to find interest and sometimes amusement in their detail. In the story which follows he set down, and not without some fidelity to circumstance, dream circumstance, a phase of what we call recurrent dreams. As the tale progressed, he felt an inclination to treat the subject more fully, more philosophically, and eventually he laid the manuscript away. The time did not come when he was moved to rewrite it, and for the pure enjoyment of it as a delicate fancy, it may be our good fortune that he left it unchanged. A. B. P. I met her first when I was seventeen and she fifteen. It was in a dream. No, I did not meet her. I overtook her. It was in a Missourian village, which I had never been in before, and was not in at that time, except dreamwise. In the flesh I was on the Atlantic seaboard, ten or twelve hundred miles away. The thing was sudden and without preparation, after the custom of dreams. There I was, crossing a wooden bridge that had a wooden rail and was untidy with scattered wisps of hay, and there she was, five steps in front of me. Half a second previously neither of us was there. This was the exit of the village which lay immediately behind us. Its last house was the blacksmith's shop, and the peaceful clinking of the hammers, a sound which nearly always seems remote and is always touched with a spirit of loneliness, and a feeling of soft regret for something, you don't know what, was wafted to my ear over my shoulder. In front of us was the winding country road, with woods on one side, and on the other a rail fence, with blackberry vines and hazel bushes crowding its angles. On an upper rail a bluebird, and scurrying toward him along the same rail a fox squirrel with his tail bent high like a shepherd's crook. Beyond the fence a rich field of grain, and far away a farmer in shirt-sleeves and straw hat wading knee-deep through it. No other representative of life, and no noise at all. Everywhere a Sabbath stillness. I remember it all, and the girl, too, and just how she walked, and how she was dressed. In the first moment I was five steps behind her. In the next one I was at her side, without either stepping or gliding. It merely happened. The transfer ignored space. I noticed that, but not with any surprise. It seemed a natural process. I was at her side. I put my arm around her waist and drew her close to me, for I loved her. And although I did not know her, my behavior seemed to me quite natural and right, and I had no misgivings about it. She showed no surprise, no distress, no displeasure, but put an arm around my waist and turned up her face to mine with a happy welcome in it. And when I bent down to kiss her, and she received the kiss, as if she was expecting it, and as if it was quite natural for me to offer it, and her to take it, and have pleasure in it. The affection which I felt for her, and which she manifestly felt for me, was a quite simple fact. But the quality of it was another matter. It was not the affection of brother and sister. It was closer than that, more clinging, more endearing, more reverent and it was not the love of sweethearts, for there was no fire in it. It was somewhere between the two, and was finer than either, and more exquisite, more profoundly contenting. We often experience this strange and gracious thing in our dream loves, and we remember it as a feature of our childhood loves, too. We strolled along across the bridge and down the road, chatting like the oldest friends. She called me George and that seemed natural and right, though it was not my name, and I called her Alice, and she did not correct me, though without doubt it was not her name. Everything that happened seemed just natural and to be expected. Once I said, What a dear little hand it is! And without any words she laid it gratefully in mine for me to examine it. 
I did it, remarking upon its littleness, its delicate beauty, and its satin skin, then kissed it. She put it up to her lips without saying anything, and kissed it in the same place. Around a curve of the road, at the end of half a mile, we came to a log house, and entered it, and found the table set and everything on it steaming hot, a roast turkey, corn in the ear, butter beans, and the rest of the usual things, and a cat curled up asleep in a splint-bottomed chair by the fireplace. But no people, just emptiness and silence. She said she would look in the next room if I would wait for her. So I sat down, and she passed through a door, which closed behind her with a click of the latch. I waited and waited. Then I got up and followed, for I could not any longer bear to have her out of my sight. I passed through the door, and found myself in a strange sort of cemetery, a city of innumerable tombs and monuments, stretching far and wide on every hand, and flushed with pink and gold lights flung from the sinking sun. I turned around, and the log-house was gone. I ran here and there and yonder down the lanes between the rows of tombs calling Alice, and presently the night closed down, and I could not find my way. Then I woke, in deep distress over my loss, and was in my bed in Philadelphia, and I was not seventeen now, but nineteen. Ten years afterward, in another dream, I found her. I was seventeen again, and she was still fifteen. I was in a grassy place in the twilight deeps of a magnolia forest some miles above Natchez, Mississippi. The trees were snowed over with great blossoms, and the air was loaded with their rich and strenuous fragrance. The ground was high, and through a rift in the wood a burnished patch of the river was visible in the distance. I was sitting on the grass, absorbed in thinking, when an arm was laid around my neck, and there was Alice sitting by my side and looking into my face. A deep and satisfied happiness and an unwordable gratitude rose in me, but with it there was no feeling of surprise, and there was no sense of a time-lapse. The ten years amounted to hardly even a yesterday, indeed to hardly even a noticeable fraction of it. We dropped in the tranquillest way into affectionate caressings and pettings, and chatted along without a reference to the separation, which was natural, for I think we did not know there had been any that one might measure with either clock or almanac. She called me Jack, and I called her Helen, and those seemed the right and proper names, and perhaps neither of us suspected that we had ever borne others, or if we did suspect it, it was probably not a matter of consequence. She had been beautiful ten years before. She was just as beautiful still, girlishly young and sweet and innocent, and she was still that now. She had had blue eyes, a hair of flossy gold before. She had black hair now, and dark brown eyes. I noted these differences, but they did not suggest change. To me she was the same girl she was before, absolutely. It never occurred to me to ask what became of the log house. I doubt if I even thought of it. We were living in a simple and natural and beautiful world where everything that happened was natural and right, and was not perplexed with the unexpected or with any forms of surprise, and so there was no occasion for explanations and no interest attaching to such things. We had a dear and pleasant time together, and were like a couple of ignorant and contented children. Helen had a summer hat on. She took it off presently, and said, "'It was in the way. Now you can kiss me better.' It seemed to me merely a bit of courteous and considered wisdom, nothing more, and a natural thing for her to think of and do. We went wandering through the woods, and came to a limpid and shallow stream, a matter of three yards wide. She said, "'I must not get my feet wet, dear. Carry me over.' I took her in my arms and gave her my hat to hold. This was to keep my own feet from getting wet. I did not know why this should have that effect. I merely knew it, and she knew it, too. I crossed the stream and said I would go on carrying her, because it was so pleasant, and she said it was pleasant to her, too, and wished we had thought of it sooner. It seemed to me a pity that we should have walked so far, both of us on foot, when we could have been having this higher enjoyment, and I spoke of it regretfully, as a something lost which could never be got back. She was troubled about it, too, and said there must be some way to get it back, and she would think. 
after musing deeply a little while she looked up radiant and proud and said she had found it carry me back and start over again i can see now that that was no solution but at the time it seemed luminous with intelligence and i believed that there was not another little head in the world that could have worked out that difficult problem with such swiftness and success i told her that and it pleased her and she said she was glad it all happened so that i could see how capable she was after thinking a moment she added that it was quite atrious the words seemed to mean something i do not know why in fact it seemed to cover the whole ground and leave nothing more to say i admired the nice aptness and the flashing felicity of the phrase and was filled with respect for the marvelous mind that had been able to engender it i think less of it now it is a noticeable fact that the intellectual coinage of dreamland often passes for more there than it would fetch here many a time in after years my dream sweetheart threw off golden sayings which crumbled to ashes under my pencil when i was setting them down in my notebook after breakfast i carried her back and started over again and all the long afternoon i bore her in my arms miles upon miles and it never occurred to either of us that there was anything remarkable in a youth like me being able to carry that sweet bundle around half a day without some sense of fatigue or need of rest there are many dream worlds but none is so rightly and reasonably and pleasantly arranged as that one after dark we reached a great plantation house and it was her home i carried her in and the family knew me and i knew them although we had not met before and the mother asked me with ill-disguised anxiety how much twelve times fourteen was and i said a hundred and thirty-five and she put it down on a piece of paper saying it was her habit in the process of perfecting her education not to trust important particulars to her memory and her husband was offering me a chair but noticed that helen was asleep so he said it would be best not to disturb her and he backed me softly against a wardrobe and said i could stand more easily now then a negro came in bowing humbly with his slouch hat in his hand and asked me if i would have my measure taken the question did not surprise me but it confused me and worried me and i said i should like to have advice about it he started toward the door to call advisers then he and the family and the lights began to grow dim and in a few moments the place was pitch dark but straightway there came a flood of moonlight and a gust of cold wind and i found myself crossing a frozen lake and my arms were empty the wave of grief that swept through me woke me up and i was sitting at my desk in the newspaper office in san francisco and i noticed by the clock that i had been asleep less than two minutes and what was of more consequence i was twenty-nine years old that was eighteen sixty four the next year and the year after i had momentary glimpses of my dream sweetheart but nothing more these are set down in my notebooks under their proper dates but with no talks nor other particulars added which is sufficient evidence to me that there were none to add in both of these instances there was the sudden meeting and recognition the eager approach then the instant disappearance leaving the world empty and of no worth i remember the two images quite well in fact i remember all the images of that spirit and can bring them before me without help of my notebook the habit of writing down my dreams of all sorts while they were fresh in my mind and then studying them and rehearsing them and trying to find out what the source of dreams is and which of the two or three separate persons inhabiting us is their architect has given me a good dream memory a thing which is not usual with people for few drill the dream memory and no memory can be kept strong without that i spent a few months in the hawaiian islands in eighteen sixty six and in october of that year i delivered my maiden lecture it was in san francisco in the following january i arrived in new york and had just completed my thirty-first year in that year i saw my platonic dream sweetheart again in this dream i was again standing on the stage of the opera house in san francisco ready to lecture and with the audience vividly individualized before me in the strong light i began spoke a few words and stopped cold with fright for i discovered that i had no subject no text 
nothing to talk about. I choked for a while, then got out a few words, a lame, poor attempt at humor. The house made no response. There was a miserable pause, then another attempt and another failure. There were a few scornful laughs. Otherwise the house was silent, unsmilingly austere, deeply offended. I was consuming with shame. In my distress I tried to work upon its pity. I began to make servile apologies mixed with gross and ill-timed flatteries, and to beg and plead for forgiveness. This was too much, and the people broke into insulting cries, whistlings, hootings, and catcalls, and in the midst of this they rose and began to struggle in a confused mass toward the door. I stood dazed and helpless looking out over this spectacle, and thinking how everybody would be talking about it next day, and I could not show myself in the streets. When the house was become wholly empty and still, I sat down on the only chair that was on the stage, and bent my head down on the reading-desk to shut out the look of that place. Soon that familiar dream-voice spoke my name, and swept all my troubles away. "'Robert?' I answered. "'Agnes!' The next moment we two were lounging up the blossomy gorge called the Iao Valley in the Hawaiian Islands. I recognized, without any explanations, that Robert was not my name, but only a pet name, a common noun, and meant dear, and both of us knew that Agnes was not a name, but only a pet name, a common noun, whose spirit was affectionate, but not conveyable with exactness in any but the dream language. It was about the equivalent of dear, but the dream vocabulary shaves meanings finer and closer than do the world's daytime dictionaries. We did not know why those words should have those meanings. We had used words which had no existence in any known language, and had expected them to be understood, and they were understood. In my notebooks there are several letters from this dream sweetheart, in some unknown tongue, presumably dream tongue, with translations added. I should like to be master of that tongue, then I could talk in shorthand. Here is one of those letters, the whole of it. Rax Oha Tal Translation when you receive this, it will remind you that I long to see your face and touch your hand, for the comfort of it and the peace. It is swifter than waking thought, for thought is not thought at all, but only a vague and formless fog until it is articulated into words. We wandered far up the fairy gorge, gathering the beautiful flowers of the ginger plant, and talking affectionate things, and tying and retying each other's ribbons and cravats, which didn't need it and finally sat down in the shade of a tree, and climbed the vine-hung precipices with our eyes, up and up and up toward the sky, to where the drifting scarfs of white mist clove them across, and left the green summits floating pale and remote, like spectral islands wandering in the deeps of space. And then we descended to earth, and talked again. "'How still it is, and soft, and balmy and reposeful!' I could never tire of it. You like it, don't you, Robert?" Yes, and I like the whole region, all the islands. Maui! It is a darling island. I have been here before, have you? Once. But it wasn't an island then. What was it? It was a sufa. I understood. It was the dream word for part of a continent. What were the people like? They hadn't come yet. There weren't any. Do you know, Agnes, that is Haleakala, the dead volcano over there across the valley. Was it here in your friend's time? Yes, but it was burning. Do you travel much? I think so. Not here much, but in the stars a good deal. Is it pretty there? She used a couple of dream words for, You will go with me some time, and you will see. Noncommittal, as one perceives now, but I did not notice it then. A man-of-war bird lit on her shoulder. I put out my hand and caught it. Its feathers began to fall out, and it turned into a kitten. Then the kitten's body began to contract itself to a ball, and put out hairy, long legs, and soon it was a tarantula. I was going to keep it, but it turned into a starfish, and I threw it away. Agnes said it was not worth while to try to keep things. There was no stability about them. I suggested rocks but she said a rock was like the rest, it wouldn't stay. 
she picked up a stone and it turned into a bat and flew away these curious matters interested me but that was all they did not stir my wonder while we were sitting there in the yao gorge talking a kanaka came along who was wrinkled and bent and white-headed and he stopped and talked to us in the native tongue and we understood him without trouble and answered him in his own speech he said he was a hundred and thirty years old and he remembered captain cook well and was present when he was murdered saw it with his own eyes and also helped then he showed us his gun which was of strange make and he said it was his own invention and was to shoot arrows with though one loaded it with powder and it had a percussion lock he said it would carry a hundred miles it seemed a reasonable statement i had no fault to find with it and it did not in any way surprise me he loaded it and fired an arrow aloft and it darted into the sky and vanished then he went his way saying that the arrow would fall near us in half an hour and would go many yards into the earth not minding the rocks i took the time and we waited reclining upon the mossy slant at the base of a tree and gazing into the sky by and by there was a hissing sound followed by a dull impact and agnes uttered a groan she said in a series of fainting gasps take me to your arms it passed through me hold me to your heart i am afraid to die closer closer it is growing dark i cannot see you don't leave me where are you you are not gone you will not leave me i would not leave you then her spirit passed she was clay in my arms the scene changed in an instant and i was awake and crossing bond street in new york with a friend and it was snowing hard we had been talking and there had been no observable gaps in the conversation i doubt if i had made any more than two steps while i was asleep i am satisfied that even the most elaborate and incident crowded dream is seldom more than a few seconds in length it would not cost me very much of a strain to believe in mohammed's seventy-year dream which began when he knocked his glass over and ended in time for him to catch it before the water was spilled within a quarter of an hour i was in my quarters undressed ready for bed and was jotting down my dream in my notebook a striking thing happened now i finished my notes and was just going to turn out the gas when i was caught with a most strenuous gape for it was very late and i was very drowsy i fell asleep and dreamed again what now follows occurred while i was asleep and when i woke again the gape had completed itself but not long before i think for i was still on my feet i was in athens a city which i had not then seen but i recognized the parthenon from the pictures although it had a fresh look and was in perfect repair i passed by it and climbed a grassy hill toward a palatial sort of mansion which was built of red terracotta and had a spacious portico whose roof was supported by a rank of fluted columns with corinthian capitals it was noonday but i met no one i passed into the house and entered the first room it was very large and light its walls were of polished and richly tinted and veined onyx and its floor was a pictured pattern in soft colors laid in tiles i noted the details of the furniture and the ornaments a thing which i should not have been likely to do when awake and they took sharp hold and remained in my memory they are not really dim yet and this was more than thirty years ago there was a person present agnes i was not surprised to see her but only glad she was in the simple greek costume and her hair and eyes were different as to color from those she had had when she died in the hawaiian islands half an hour before but to me she was exactly her own beautiful little self as i had always known her and she was still fifteen and i was seventeen once more she was sitting on an ivory settee crocheting something or other and had her crewels in a shallow willow work-basket in her lap i sat down by her and we began to chat in the usual way i remembered her death but the pain and the grief and the bitterness which had been so sharp and so desolating to me at the moment that it happened had wholly passed from me now and had left not a scar i was grateful to have her back but there was no realizable sense that she had ever been gone and so it did not occur to me to speak about it and she made no reference to it herself it may be that she had often died before and knew that there was nothing lasting about it 
and consequently nothing important enough in it to make conversation out of. When I think of that house and its belongings, I recognize what a master in taste and drawing and color and arrangement is the dream artist who resides in us. In my waking hours, when the inferior artist in me is in command, I cannot draw even the simplest picture with a pencil, nor do anything with a brush and colors. I cannot bring before my mind's eye the detailed image of any building known to me except my own house at home, of St. Paul's, St. Peter's, the Eiffel Tower, the Taj, the Capitol at Washington. I can reproduce only portions, partial glimpses. The same with Niagara Falls, the Matterhorn, and other familiar things in nature. I cannot bring before my mind's eye the face or figure of any human being known to me. I have seen my family at breakfast within the past two hours. I cannot bring their images before me. I do not know how they look. Before me, as I write, I see a little grove of young trees in the garden. High above them projects the slender lance of a young pine. Beyond it is a glimpse of the upper half of a dull white chimney covered by an A-shaped little roof shingled with brown-red tiles, and a half a mile away is a hilltop, densely wooded, and the red is cloven by a curved wide vacancy which is smooth and grass-clad. I cannot shut my eyes and reproduce that picture as a whole at all, nor any single detail of it except the grassy curve, and that but vaguely and fleetingly. But my dream artist can draw anything and do it perfectly. He can paint with all the colors and all the shades, and do it with delicacy and truth. He can place before me vivid images of palaces, cities, hamlets, hovels, mountains, valleys, lakes, skies, glowing in sunlight or moonlight, or veiled in driving gusts of snow or rain and he can set before me people who are intensely alive, and who feel and express their feelings in their faces, and who also talk and laugh, sing and swear. And when I wake I can shut my eyes and bring back those people and the scenery and the buildings, and not only in general view but often in nice detail. While Agnes and I sat talking in that grand Athens house, several stately Greeks entered from another part of it, disputing warmly about something or other, and passed us by with courteous recognition. And among them was Socrates. I recognized him by his nose. A moment later the house and Agnes and Athens vanished away, and I was in my quarters in New York again, and reaching for my notebook. In our dreams, I know it, we do make the journeys we seem to make. We do see the things we seem to see, the people, the horses, the cats, the dogs, the birds, the whales, are real, not chimeras, they are living spirits, not shadows, and they are immortal and indestructible. They go whither they will, they visit all resorts, all points of interest, even the twinkling suns that wander in the wastes of space. That is where those strange mountains are which slide from under our feet while we walk, and where those vast caverns are whose bewildering avenues close behind us and in front when we are lost, and shut us in. We know this because there are no such things here, and they must be there, because there is no other place. This tale is long enough, and I will close it now. In the forty-four years that I have known my dreamland sweetheart, I have seen her once in two years, on an average. Mainly these were glimpses, but she was always immediately recognizable, notwithstanding she was so given to repairing herself and getting up doubtful improvements in her hair and eyes. She was always fifteen, and looked it, and acted it, and I was always seventeen, and never felt a day older. To me she is a real person, not a fiction and her sweet and innocent society has been one of the prettiest and pleasantest experiences of my life. I know that to you her talk will not seem of the first intellectual order, but you should hear her in dreamland, then you would see. I saw her a week ago, just for a moment. Fifteen, as usual, and I seventeen, instead of going on sixty-three, as I was when I went to sleep. We were in India, and Bombay was in sight. Also Windsor Castle, its towers and battlements veiled in a delicate haze, and from it the Thames flowed, curving and winding between its swarded banks, to our feet. I said, 
there is no question about it england is the most beautiful of all the countries her face lighted with approval and she said with that sweet and earnest irrelevance of hers it is because it is so marginal then she disappeared it was just as well she could probably have added nothing to that rounded and perfect statement without damaging its symmetry this glimpse of her carries me back to maui and that time when i saw her gasp out her young life that was a terrible thing to me at the time it was preternaturally vivid and the pain and the grief and the misery of it to me transcended many sufferings that i have known in waking life for everything in a dream is more deep and strong and sharp and real than is ever its pale imitation in the unreal life which is ours when we go about awake and clothed with our artificial selves in this vague and dull-tinted artificial world when we die we shall slough off this cheap intellect perhaps and go abroad into dreamland clothed in our real selves and aggrandized and enriched by the command over the mysterious mental magician who is here not our slave but only our guest. End of My Platonic Sweetheart by Mark Twain This is John Greenman.